Good morning and welcome back to the Scottish Parliament. I hope you enjoyed your first evening of the summit. Uh, the first plenary session this morning continues and focuses on culture and heritage. And I'd first like to invite UNESCO's Assistant Director General for Culture, Francesco Banderin, to join us. From 2000 to 2010, he was Director of the UNESCO World Heritage Centre and Secretary of the World Heritage Convention. And since 2010, he has served as Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Culture. Professor Francesco Mandarin, thank you. Presiding officer, honorable ministers, dear colleagues and friends, um, I would like, first of all, to express our thanks, the thanks of UNESCO to the summit for inviting us. Uh, it is really a pleasure and a honor to be with you to, today to exchange uh, opinions and experiences on what we think are, you know, is a critical uh, element of our lives and our societies. That is to say, uh, the role of culture in all its uh, manifestations and forms uh, in uh, the development of societies. I'd like also to thank uh, Jonathan, an old friend, you know, for uh, extending this invitation to, to us. Um, as I had the task of uh, somehow opening up this uh, uh, system of plenaries and round tables, uh, please allow me to uh, put on the table two uh, elements, two elements for discussion, which I, we think are at the moment uh, the ones that uh, uh, should attract the uh, interest and the concern of the public opinion and the international uh, community. Um, these two items may seem a bit different, but uh, in our view they are uh, convergent and, and definitely they have to be uh, considered and worked uh, together. The first one is uh, uh, the policy that uh, UNESCO, but many other uh, member states and many other uh, public and private bodies are developing and are supporting uh, in the past uh, decades, I would say, but with uh, an acceleration in recent time to place culture at the core of international development. Um, I will elaborate a little bit, and I hope that during the, the rest of the plenary and during the discussion we will be able to exchange further on this issue. And the second item is uh, um, the issue of uh, protection of heritage in areas of conflict. As you know, an, uh, an area of concern of our organization, but I would say in general of the uh, member states of UNESCO and the member states and, and the public opinions uh, that has you know, taken, uh, unfortunately, you know, a very important role in our, in our daily work. Um, well, let me just briefly uh, mention, uh, gives you some elements on the first uh, of the two items. <clears throat> Since the 1980s, uh, UNESCO has come up with the idea that culture in all its you know, different manifestations. I will use this term as a synthetic term for, to uh, summarize uh, elements that concern heritage, other that concerns creativity, of course, including the uh, cultural institutions and many other cultural dimensions uh, that uh, have been along the decades, along the year, somehow developed by, uh, by our organization through the uh, introduction in the international system of a number of treaties or conventions that deal with different types of heritage. Um, in the 1990s, we joined hands also with the, with the World Bank, at that time led by Mr. Wolfenson, to have you know, culture as an important dimension of development. And then in the year 2000, especially in 2005, a treaty, a uh, convention, was adopted uh, by the member states. Uh, this treaty is called the uh, Convention for the Protection and the Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions and somehow you know, seals the system of conventions that UNESCO has put in place uh, uh, since uh, uh, its beginning, since its origin, you know, to protect cultural heritage. Just for your information, we have six of these treaties some of them very famous, like the World Heritage Convention or the Intangible Heritage Conventions, other very well known, like the 1954 Convention for the Protection of Heritage in Case of Armed Conflict, which I will come back to, and the 1970 Convention for the Fight Against the Illicit Traffic of Cultural Heritage, and, and other, other elements. So we try to always say 
uh, to our, uh, our own system, the United Nations, uh, to the other agencies uh, that deal with development, that culture should be put at the core of the development process, that no development can be effective and effectual unless it considers the culture and dimension. I think we've been partially successful uh, until now, but in recent times, uh, and especially since a campaign that we uh, strongly uh, pushed in the, in the past three, four years, uh, we were able to achieve some important results. I think these results are visible in the uh, Agenda 2030. This is uh, uh, the uh, current international development agenda adopted by the United Nations um, last year in September. But it took many, many years to uh, convince our own system, which sometimes you know, is a little bit hard to convince, and, uh, uh, and the member states have voted the agenda that this dimension should be, in fact, present in the, uh, in the system of uh, goals and indicators that have been uh, approved and, and adopted. You will find <coughs> culture is a, uh, somehow a transversal dimension, so you will not find a goal that is called culture, but uh, you will find culture in many of the uh, goals that have been uh, you know, approved uh, last year. Uh, those concern environment, for instance, those that have to do with health, uh, those that have to do with economic development, and so on. In one of them, uh, which is goal 11 in particular, uh, the one that concerns cities, culture is perhaps as its strongest expression. Uh, and we're very happy for this because, in fact, cities are uh, definitely a, the future dimension where everything uh, happens, in particular in, in culture. Uh, and we have uh, also uh, an opportunity uh, in the coming two months, uh, as you know, in October, um, the United Nations will convene uh, the um, Habitat 3 uh, conference, which is the a conference that takes place every 20 years, so it's really uh, you know, forward-looking and somehow considering the long, the long term uh, dimension of development. And if you had the opportunity to read the draft text that has been already um, proposed and <coughs> somehow finalized, uh, you will see, uh, and we are very happy for this, that culture has a really uh, a prominent role in the way in which the United Nations conceive and propose the development agenda uh, for cities in the next uh, 20 years. Uh, we're very happy for this because uh, we've been part of this process, but I think we're, most of it we're happy because we think that this is the right way to go. Uh, if there is an area, a dimension where culture can be and express its power, uh, certainly this is the urban environment. Uh, we have uh, also developed all, all along these years, and I will not go into much uh, detail, perhaps inviting you to uh, read when it will be published our you know, big report, the global uh, report on C culture for sustainable cities, which we are issuing in, in uh, Quito in October when the Habitat 3 conference will convene. But certainly we have you know, an area which is very specific to heritage. We have over 300 World Heritage cities in the World Heritage list. We have an area that concerns more creativity. Uh, we have 120 cities now in this uh, Creative Cities Network. By the way, Edinburgh is one of them. Actually, both. Edinburgh is both World Heritage and Creative City for literature, one, the first actually for, for this category. Uh, so, and we have other <coughs> networks that concern UNESCO mandate, both in education, uh, science, and social sciences. So we certainly think, think, think and see uh, this urban dimension as a very important strategic area for the development of this original idea that culture is a pillar of international development framework. So I would like to say that this is really a major uh, piece for us, something that we will continue working on. And I can see in many of the statements that have been done uh, in the summit that there is a, a large consensus on this. I would like uh, really to thank you for this because it's very important to have support uh, from you know, other bodies, other meetings, other f forms, expression of civil society, and of course of public policy. Now, in, uh, in the same uh, vein, I would say that we need support for the other item that I mentioned uh, as uh, you know, being at the core of our concern, the destruction of cultural heritage. We have here with us our friend, Mamun Abdul Karim. I will not uh, go much in detail because he is the one that lives on a daily basis uh, uh, this drama. But certainly, you know, it has been for us in the past uh, 70 years at least, 
you know, since UNESCO was created, <laughs> an agenda of action. Uh, UNESCO has always been active in areas of conflict uh, because that's our mandate. We are a UN uh, body, uh, but mostly in, in the, with the function of somehow, let's call it post-conflict reconstruction. We've been working, in, of course, in Angkor and Afghanistan, uh, in many other, in Iraq and so many other countries after the conflict has uh, uh, left its marks and, and signs of destruction. Um, we have, of course, some tools. We have two important international treaties. I mentioned them earlier, the 1954 Convention for uh, Protection of Heritage in Case of Armed Conflict and the 1970 Convention, which is a much broader, uh, has a much broader scope, the illicit traffic or cultural heritage, but now it becomes very important in areas of conflict. And, of course, we have used these tools uh, to uh, do our work uh, in all the areas where we have been uh, involved. I mentioned Angkor, you may remember certainly the destruction of the Bambian Buddhas as a major shock for the uh, international public opinion, uh, the destruction of uh, Bridge Moster and the Library of Sarajevo here in Europe uh, 20 years ago, and now what we see today. The problem is that today we see not a war here and a war there, we, say we see 10 conflicts. We see have a, a very extended, unmanageable front of distractions um, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Central Asia. Uh, this seems to, to become a very, very critical and unfortunately widespread uh, phenomenon. And this brought us to uh, some reflection. We certainly uh, <coughs> saw that the tools that we had available, I mentioned these uh, uh, conventions, but there are uh, other tools, were really not sufficient to address the issue. So we are currently uh, working uh, together with the member states to try to improve our capacity to deliver some support uh, and to prevent damages of uh, cultural heritage in areas of conflict. Uh, last year, in November, the General Conference of UNESCO adopted a strategy which is called the Strategy for the Reinforcement of Protection of Cultural Heritage in Case of Conflicts. And this strategy, we're now implementing it, has essentially a three-tier um, structure. We try to improve the capacity to prevent damages, uh, certainly what concerns sites and museums and so on. Um, we try to do something more during conflict, which is very difficult, as you can imagine. It's very hard to intervene in areas when there are fights and, and combats are taking place. And of course, we are trying to uh, 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 improve our capacity to you know, he help and support the post-conflict reconstruction. Now, of course, these activities are you know, very, some of them are very new for us, and we see them, especially the, 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 the issue of intervention during conflict, we see them essentially uh, around three areas. Uh, we would like to improve our capacity to support those who are in the ground. There's always somebody in the ground, even when during a conflict, and uh, I think the experience of Mahmoud will certainly be illuminating on this. Um, we have uh, <coughs> the possibility of uh, uh, supporting uh, the peacekeeping operations that are, are mandated by the United Nations. We have already two situations where you know, currently two of the UN missions, the one in Mali and the one in Congo, have in their mandate a specific uh, uh, component of cultural and natural heritage protection. And of course, we can work with the humanitarian uh, operators, particularly we have just signed an uh, uh, agreement with the International <coughs> Committee of the Red Cross, <clears throat> which is an extremely important uh, body, you know, the one that goes into the conflict when everybody goes out. Now, in about a month, we will present our action plan to our body, and we hope that with the support of member states, we can move forward and be able, be unable to deliver a better service uh, to uh, those who are in charge of protection of cultural heritage in these critical zones. Uh, I'm sure that this issue uh, has been already raised during the summit will uh, be further discussed and I really look forward to cooperating with member states that are attended this summit and all the, the other ones you know, to try to define a system that is more effective at the international level in support of the protection of cultural heritage. Well, these are the two uh, elements that I put on the table. They are quite big beasts, both of them. I hope that during this uh, uh, discussion and during this summit, we will be able to deliberate and elaborate on this. Thank you very much.
Professor Bandarin, thank you very much. Uh, it's now a pleasure, my pleasure to welcome Prince Amin Aga Khan. Prince Amin is a member of the board of the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development, a director of the Aga Khan Foundation and the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. He has been actively associated with the Aga Khan Award for Architecture and the Historic Cities Support Programme. Prince Amin, thank you. Presenting officer, honourable ministers, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you will allow me to begin by expressing a couple of personal views and opinions, since they probably colour my attitude to our institutional activities at the Aga Khan Development Network, known as AKDN. My educational background was largely literary and musical. I believe that all art is essentially a reflection of our hearts, of our dreams, our fears, our regrets, and our experiences. In that sense, the arts are universal, something we all share as an expression of our common human condition. They bind us and unite us, from the prehistoric cave paintings to the abstract, from the half tone to the quarter tone. Our challenge is to see and not just to look, to listen and not just to hear. Against this common background, for me, culture is by definition evolutionary. Whether the dialogue between people and places ensued from education, as it did in the Grand Tours, and it should nowadays, from commerce, as it did along the historical trade routes, from war and conquest, as was so often or less the case, or whatever. Culture is thus something we share, a human global heritage that binds us and in no way divides us. The dialogue of cultures has existed since time immemorial. The conflict of cultures is a modern and I hope temporary oxymoron. The AKDN has been engaged in culture as part of its development activities in the third world since 1977 and the creation of the Arkhan Award for Architecture. Our action stemmed from our realization that in many places where we work, their cultural heritage is in fact the only asset at the disposal of the communities we seek to assist. We considered that it was important, indeed often essential, to activate such cultural assets as intellectual, economic, and aspirational generators of ideas and actions that could possibly shape the quality of life of those communities. Contrary to earlier prejudices and preconceived notions in many areas of the developing world, and incidentally still all too often alive nowadays in the West, we took the position in those areas of unmet economic and social need, which is where we, are, where we work, that culture is not a luxury, not something by definition, definition elitist and unfair, but quite to the contrary, a major potential source of economic and social development. Culture as not just the awareness of a proud, memorable and exclusive past, but something that can and should be made a commitment to a just, progressive and inclusive future. The challenge was how to make historic buildings and public spaces of recognized cultural significance, how to make sounds, colors, and shapes of recognized cultural meaning become the sustainable basis for economic and social progress. Contrary to the public assumption at the time, culture has to be seen and to become an asset to development rather than a further unwanted drain on already limited resources. The activities of AKDN in the realm of culture are implemented by our contrast for culture, known as AKTC with our main of acronyms. There are many projects of AKTC which I could present as examples of the path which we have sought to trace. In Cairo, we took a mountainous, centuries-old urban dump by the historic old town in an area of Cairo less well-known to tourists, being essentially Muslim and not pharaonic, and we turned into a public park, Al-Azhar Park, the park looks across the historic city toward the citadel and measures some 28 hectares. It includes a lake, a couple of restaurants, employing incidentally more than 200 local persons, a children's area, a small amphitheater for theatrical, musical, and other presentations, and a number of recreational areas. It has these past years welcomed on average two billion visitors per annum in times of peace and in times of public stress. And lo and behold, it generates an annual financial surplus of an average of some US dollars, one million, which surplus has ensured us not only the upkeep of the park itself and its facilities, but has permitted us to finance and execute since 2003, the restoration of 1.5 kilometers of the historic Ayyubid 12th century wall that runs along the park and that had fallen into ruin. More, it has permitted us to complete a comprehensive urban regeneration program in neighboring Darbal Ahmar, 
on the other side of the wall, where now several AKD agencies working together have been able to implement health, education, microfinance, housing, sanitation programs, arts and music programs, while rehabilitating five historic monuments and smaller open urban spaces. We are even debating the creation of a small museum in Dabal Ahmad to exhibit the historical objects excavated and discovered during the restoration of the Ayyubid Wall, and thus present to the public the history and arts of ancient Cairo. Now, not only is Al-Hazar Park financially self-sufficient, but it has created economic and social benefits and a vastly improved quality of life for a catchment area peopled by some 200,000 citizens that are neighbors of the park. In the years to come, it is to be hoped that the history and culture of Muslim Cairo will take their place alongside the more commonly known pharaonic culture of Egypt, thus offering, part of one would hope through increased tourism to that part of Cairo, further jobs and economic and social benefits to the population of the area. In Darb al-Ahmad, creation of a green space has resulted in the restoration of significant monuments and an entire area development. Further away in Mali, we restored the three significant earthen mosques in Jenny, Timbuktu, and Mopti. In Timbuktu, several Sufi mausolea attached to the mosque have since been damaged by the soldiers of prejudice during occupation of the city. But one of the very good consequences of our original restoration work is that we have precise architectural drawings of these mausolea, which provide the necessary basis to accomplish the restoration of these small buildings after the departure of the occupying forces. Further, as part of the restoration work in Mopti around the Great Mosque, we entered into a close working relationship with the local population. We discussed with them how to improve that area of the city and simultaneously how to ensure the longevity of the historic monuments just restored, ensuring the availability of the funds that would be required for their maintenance without it being necessary to call upon public finances. The local population responded enthusiastically and collaborated fully with us in this endeavor, giving freely of their time and abilities, so that with our help and technical advice, the neighborhood was greatly upgraded through an extensive program of street improvements, sanitation programs, training programs for masons, recycling programs, and the creation of clean toilet and bath facilities attached to a public cafe and a new center for earthen architecture. The center's aim is to inform the public about the techniques in building in mud and to perpetuate those techniques, perpetuate those techniques, and it has a permanent display of objects, samples, and images highlighting this rich tradition. And within this revived area, an array of shops handicraft outlets, and small commercial activities came into being. An entire myad, a multi-input area development, had in fact occurred as a result of the restoration of some monuments, a myad largely realized and made operational by self-help. Our experience shows that the local population must be centrally involved in any such project. Their buy-in is and must be seen as part of the asset base being developed. Their sense of how the project in question will affect their futures is necessary for them to show the pride and confidence in the project that ensures its resilience. Indeed, the planning of cultural interventions aimed at development must involve centrally from the outset the local population. Just it must consider issues related to the quality of life of those local populations. In a nutshell, the development scenario should have at its very heart the economic and social sustainability of the local population, recognizing that local confidence is a primary requirement. As I have earlier indicated, self-sustainability of initiatives in the cultural field is essential and must be at the heart of the planning exercise. Eventual income streams must be projected and later realized that are sufficient to sustain the project or maintain it, for instance, if it's a building, on a long-term basis, not just in the development stage, but on an ongoing basis thereafter. The goal should be an income stream that will produce in the longer term a surplus, which surplus can be reinvested in the project or can, as in the case of Double Ahmad, make other projects possible. To be avoided as a fundamental error is that the project should turn into a net drain on the local population, let alone on the, on the national or local governments. Of course, where historical buildings are concerned, reutilization of these buildings to give them a new purpose, a new life, which can generate the necessary income stream, can frequently become something of a conundrum, a challenge. Hotels, restaurants, cultural centers, display areas, meeting spaces, and a thousand other possibilities present themselves. Here again, local wisdom, combined with careful thought into and study of the characteristics of that particular neighborhood, of the general area, are required. Cultural assets and mini museums tend to lose money for many years. Restaurants require sometimes costly kitchens and preferably a good cook. 
Meeting spaces have to be promoted, which can be expensive. The pitfalls are many. The role of culture in development has more facets than you might think at first sight. I've mentioned Mali and Cairo. We have a similar project in Delhi, for instance, where in Humayun's tomb, the Sanda nursery in Nizamuddin Basti, we have one of the densest ensemble of monuments in the country, 45 of them, including nine Mughal era tombs, spread over 250 acres of heritage in central Delhi, and urban renewal is again being implemented, green space restored and created, vegetation identified and categorized, and a plant nursery revived, while master craftsmen in stone carving, plasterwork, masonry, carpentry are being trained, creating new employment. In this project too, we have sought to improve the quality of life of the resident communities, attending to the local requirements in health, education and sanitation, urban improvement, vocational training and waste collection, housing improvement, landscaping and madrasa improvement. As in Mali, many of these project responsibilities will be, or are already, taken over by the residents themselves. And we have similar projects in Kabul and Herat in Afghanistan, and among the earlier such initiatives were those in Hunza in the northern areas of Pakistan. Even our music initiative is designed not only to protect and continue traditional music on traditional instruments with the great poetic works of the past, but to promote new musical creations, new musical careers of different kinds, to stimulate and revitalize the arts, arts and handicrafts related to music, to create new young teachers and new scholarly institutions, to expand local curricula, and to ensure, ensure to local populations increased jobs and incomes from sources such as tourism and musical events. In these many initiatives, we have come to judge their true value, public-private partnerships. They have proved flexible, alliances often long-term and capable of numerous combinations, as they can include partner development agencies, foundations, corporations, government, universities, faith communities, individual donors, and of course, local communities. Our experience showed these public-private partnerships could often prove keystone. In summary, we believe cultural activities in the field of development can and should aim to have a positive impact on both environments and public policy, setting aside as appropriate traditional concepts of separate public and private domains. They can and should promote good governance and strengthen civil society, recognizing that civil and private institutions have unique capacities for spurring economic and social progress, while simultaneously having the intrinsic ability to meet the challenge of diversity by giving diverse constituencies effective ways to express their distinct identities within a collaborative framework. In high mountain or coastal areas, in urban or rural environments, in peaceful or post-conflict situations, the role of culture in development not only effectively combines the unique with the global, but shows that in the world of culture, globalization can be expansion and inclusion rather than homo homogenization, inspiration and unification rather than a burden and divisive. Such cultural initiatives tend also to anchor civil society where it has been disrupted by civil disorder or conflict. Cultural heritage, both material and tangible, is our common shared heritage. Simultaneously, the roots of our identity and an expression of our pluralism. My own hope is that all our efforts to see culture aid and contribute to development would result in those areas now developed producing in their turn new culture. So that culture begets culture through time and place and the internal dialogue continues. Thank you. Thank you, Prince Amin. I would now like to introduce Professor Dr. Mamoun Abdul Karim, Director General of Antiquities and Museums for Syria. And I'm sure I speak for all of us today when I say that the troubles in your country have touched us all, and I hope for you and your fellow citizens for a speedy and peaceful resolution to the convict. I'm especially grateful for you for travelling to Scotland to join us today, Professor Abdul Karim. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I thank uh, this summit of international, of the cultural, especially our colleague, Sir Jonathan Mills, to invite me, to give me this occasion to meet you, perhaps from this location, important location in Scotland, it's far, my first visit to Scotland. And through my new English also, perhaps I can send our voice, voice of war in the Syria, of the tragedy from here to international community. Perhaps international community can give us 
some warm feeling through our cold isolation. Syrian cultural heritage is experiencing violent and dangerous attacks during this recent crisis. Due to the absence of the cultural institution, threats against heritage have increased and include systematic illegal excavations carried out by professional army groups. Increased smuggled cultural objects through the Syrian border. All the border very open through all this time. Vast region extending along Syria are now classified as distressed cultural area, as well as the use of site as battlefield like Aleppo city today in tragedy. What you know, Aleppo is one of the most important world heritage city in the world. Unfortunately, now Aleppo like Warsaw city in the 1944. Another example, attack, it's ideological, by ISIS groups, terrorists, attacked Palmyra. You know through the media what happened in this city, how many buildings destroyed by this barbary to attack our common heritage. It is universal heritage, it's not just Syrian heritage, because all my time as director general, I accepted to work through this crisis since four years, as professor coming from Damascus University, I declared that we cannot divide our cultural heritage in two heritage, one for the government, another for the opposition. No, we have one heritage for all Syrian people. It's our collective identity, our collective uh, history, and we share this heritage with the international community. However, through all this tragedy, and the, our beauty of archaeology, you know how many Syria is rich, more 10,000 sites in Syria, 34 museums, many hundred thousand objects. Through so all this tragedy, however, 99% of the collection of all the museums save it. Because we started the program of the saving since 2012. I remember it was my first condition to accept to be director general of the antiquity if I can close directly the museums. Ministry of the Culture accepted directly to give me this opportunity. One week later, we closed all the museums in Syria in the end summer of 2012, since four years. Fortunately, we do it. If no, we will have disaster. As a result, we undertook several measures, not to closing the museums, saving the collection, but also it was necessary to keep touch with the local community, raising awareness. If the government not here, how I can save sites? My sole option with my colleagues to contact the elites, the local community, it's your identity, it is like the owner of your mothers. You should do keep touch with your heritage and to defend your heritage. Cooperation with international actors to catalog the damage and losses occurring to the cultural heritage of Syria. It's occasion for me also to thank UNESCO for the rule UNESCO through this crisis. UNESCO refused to leave me in this cold isolation, especially Director General of UNESCO, Madame Irina Bokova, and uh, her assistant, uh, uh, our share, dear uh, friend, Francisco Banderin, they keep in touch with me through all these four years, bad years, sad years. It was really for me, I describe it myself through CNN, all the media, I am the saddest director general in the world, because how you can defend this heritage alone? Through 2,500 persons, working with us in this directorate. We are still now working in area under control of the government and also under control of the opposition. We refuse it to cut the salary. We push it all employees to work without the politics. Our initiative, Director General and Antiquity and Museum, from the beginning of their crisis was together, people by what unites, not divides them. And this situation invites all of us to do our best 
together to put an end to this damage besetting human cultural heritage. The dangers surrounding the Syrian archaeological heritage are growing beyond our capabilities and limited resources. They cannot by any means defeat our will. We call on the international community to recognize the validity of this effort and provide assistance and support for our work to complete the international effort to a national effort inside of the Syria. The international community needs to bear in mind that the Syrian cultural heritage is part of the world heritage of humanity and that the loss of any of its components is a loss for all the humanity. In addition, we would like to urge the international community to effectively stop extremists' resources to trap the antiquities and to pressure on the neighboring countries to prohibit illicit trafficking of the Syrian archaeological, archaeological heritage. Hence, the time has come to take action before it is too late to protect our heritage, not in Syria just, but also in Libya, but also in Yemen, in Iraq, Mali, Afghanistan, etc., to protect our heritage, common heritage, what we share with the international community, against a disaster that is painful for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Abdul Karim. And I welcome Mr. Zhang Zhaolun, Vice Minister of the Ministry of Culture, the People's Republic of China, to the floor. And I'm very pleased to welcome China to our international summit and I hope we all benefit from this mutual exchange. Thank you, Minister. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure to join you at this international, Edinburgh International Culture Summit and today's panel on cultural heritage. China appreciates and actively supports the role of the UNESCO in safeguarding cultural diversity and sharing cultural assets across the world and has ratified and been committed to several UNESCO conventions, including the 1972 World Heritage Convention, Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage 2003, and Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions 2005. The collaboration between the Chinese government and the UNESCO has been tangible as well, marked by several exchanges and information platforms for cultural heritage safeguarding in the Asia-Pacific region, including a UNESCO Category 2 Center, the World Heritage Institute of Training and Research for the Asia and the Pacific region in Beijing, and the five-year-old Chengdu International Festival of Intangible Cultural Heritage in Sichuan Province, China. In order to respond to the pressure of urban development and industrialization in China's remarkable socio-economic transition in recent years, the Chinese government has given the safeguarding of cultural heritage an important place in the national development agenda and adopted a working mechanism supervised by the government, which engages various social sectors. Our work has a few highlights that are worth mentioning. First is legislative and institutional progress. Promulgated in 1982 and 2011, respectively, China's cultural heritage protection law and a law on, in, on intangible cultural heritage safeguarding provide solid legal ground for cultural heritage safeguarding. The State Council of China appointed the Chinese State Administration of Cultural Heritage and Intangible Cultural Heritage Department in the Ministry of Culture of China 
to take particular care of tangible and intangible cultural heritage nationwide at local levels, regulations, legal acts, and specialized institutions have also been established. By the end of 2015, there were more than 11,000 cultural heritage safeguarding institutions all across China, with more than 160,000 employees. Second, the principles of cultural heritage and intangible cultural heritage safeguarding have been respectively identified as safeguarding as the focus, rescuing as the priority, and avoiding excessive exploitation and negligence in management, as well as safeguarding as the focus, rescuing as the priority, and avoiding excessive exploitation and extinction for traditions. By following these principles, we mean to make the most of cultural heritages in modern times, but not at the expense of their safety and authenticity, especially the vulnerable ones. Generally, for tangible heritage, we focus on protecting them from damage and urban erosion. While for intangible heritage, we encourage their transmission, renewal, and regeneration. Thirdly, based on wide-range surveys, we created an inventory system which contains several inventories at national, provincial, city and township levels. Since 1956, we have yielded one inventory of 767,000 heritage monuments and one of 40 million heritage properties. We have also spent the last 38 years to document folklore and ethnic arts all across China. We have also published a 318-volume encyclopedia of folklore and arts of ethnic groups in China. The 470 million word long encyclopedia was acclaimed as the Great War of China's folk arts and ethnic cultural heritage. During a, national consensus, during a national census of intangible cultural heritage carried out between 2005 and 2009, we have collected 290,000 valuable properties and documents. We have taken 200 million words worth of notes and 230,000 hours of recordings and published 140,000 booklets of census. This census gave us abundant information on the demographics of China's situation and how to safeguard our cultural heritage. So we built our multi-level inventory system based on such information. At present in China, there are four levels, national level, provincial level, city level, and municipal level. There are 4,296 national heritage sites, 129 historic cities, 528 historic villages, and 30 historic neighborhoods. We currently also have identified 1,372 representative national historic items. Since 2006, the Chinese government designated the second Saturday of June as the Cultural Heritage Day. So far, 11 Cultural Heritage Days were celebrated to raise the public awareness of China's cultural identity and traditions. China adheres to the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage and ethical principles for safeguarding intangible cultural heritage in its cultural heritage safeguarding. Recently, we started a new round of training workshops on the use of convention 
and ethical principles for safeguarding institution workers all across China so that they could better understand and act in accordance with these instruments when they deal with specific safeguarding cases in China. Today, I would like to share with my international colleagues some of our ideas and practices in intangible cultural heritage safeguarding in recent years. Our principles in safeguarding intangible cultural heritage in recent years are as follows. The first is enhancing capacities. Bearers are the vehicles of conveying and transmitting intangible cultural heritage as living culture. We believe that their safeguarding capacities should be constantly enhanced to keep these elements alive and kicking, making them more visible, popular and attractive to encourage more people, especially young ones, to engage in intangible cultural heritage safeguarding and transmission to make such efforts sustainable. Second, it is important to enable intangible cultural heritage to adapt to modern life. Fundamentally, it is about people and their life. Safeguarding attempts should focus on making traditional elements more relevant to daily life of people in modern times. In order to safeguard and recreate intangible culture assets in a productive way, we support the integration of modern design and expression concepts with traditional craftsmanship to add to the commercial value of such cultural heritage that could turn into tangible products. Third, our safeguarding measures focus on strengthening and reinforcing the diverse and varied circumstances, tangible and intangible, that are necessary for the continuous evolution and interpretation of intangible cultural heritage, as well as for its transmission to future generations. Our work to safeguard intangible cultural heritage has been carried out in the spirit of the three principles that I mentioned above. So far, we have launched a salvage program to record the knowledge, skill and craftsmanship of 571 national representative intangible cultural heritage bearers that were at the risk of being lost. The central budget of China grants 20,000 renminbi to each of the national representative bearers every year to subsidize their safeguarding efforts. And in the coming five years, the number of such facilities will also increase, which we have invested in 96 currently. More than 8,000 workshop centers and ex exhibition center have been opened across the country. In 2015, the Ministry of Culture and Ministry of Education jointly initiated, initiated a training and capacity building program, which invited practitioners to be trained and re-educated. And so far, 4,500 practitioners have attended the program in classrooms in 57 higher education institutions. And these programs have been very positively received. This program provides an opportunity for communities and ethnic groups to work together and for higher education institutions to engage in cultural efforts as well. Second, we foster the rejuvenation of traditional handicrafts. We focus on the preservation of production and skills. So through the promotion and the production, we add new life into the craftsmanship. Since 2011, 100 national pilot bases for commercializing intangible cultural heritage have been set up across China. In 2015, we launched a program to rejuvenate traditional craftsmanship, which focused on both capacity building and matchmaking. We also work with universities and help them partner 
with companies that are keen to, regener to regenerate and promote traditional culture and craftsmanship. The Chinese government has written rejuvenation of traditional craftsmanship into its working papers to further boast the transmission of such heritage. Third, we endeavor to promote holistic safeguarding of in intangible cultural heritage. Since 2007, we have set up 18 national pilot zones for cultural conservation, enclosing areas of great historical significance well-maintained heritage sites and distinct and val valuable intangible cultural heritage. We support the local governments to safeguard the heritage as well as the cultural traditions. Our goal is to help each of these conservation zones celebrate their own distinct heritage and cultural values. We hope to enrich the cultural life of the people. Moreover, the Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Housing and Urban and Renewal Development and State Administration of Cultural Heritage of China have identified more than 2,500 villages as historical and heritage villages. We aim to preserve their way of life we want to stop these villages from becoming commercial shops only. We wish to preserve the soil of cultural heritage. In all these work, we're always factoring the conducive role of tourism to publicize cultural heritage. In recent years, more and more tourists have become interested in experiencing culture and discovery, discovering heritage. This is all I want to share with you on China's efforts. It is a common task for all of us to safeguard our national heritage and promote cultural development. China is always ready to strengthen exchange and tangible cooperation on cultural heritage, safeguarding with other countries. And we wish to promote further friendship and mutual understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I now move to our final speaker for this morning's session, and I would like to call Mr. Alaji Lai Mohammed, Minister of Information and Culture, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, to the floor. And we very, very much look forward to hearing the Nigerian perspective on culture and heritage. Mr. Lai Mohammed. The presiding officer, your excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to be on miss today. I've been asked to speak on an issue that is central, that is the central driving force of our economy in Nigeria. That is the diversification of our economy and the role of the culture and consequently what we now know as the creative industries in ensuring that we achieve our goals and the aspirations of the people. Our government came in at a time of dwindling earnings from crude oil, which is also had been the mainstay of our economy and the focus of previous governments. And we quickly realized that we have no choice but to quickly and wisely pursue our diversification agenda. It is noteworthy that the current administration, <clears throat> even before knowing that the price of crude oil was going to plummet, had promised Nigerians during its campaign that it was going to diversify the economy. At my very first meeting with the British Council, I posited that 
that the diversification of our economy would not just be limited to agriculture or solid minerals sectors. And I believe now, more than ever then, that one industry we'll be focusing on will be the creative industries because it is a major low-hanging fruit that is immediately available for exploitation. All over the world, culture has been a unique symbol of identity that distinguishes a group of people with the same political history from other people. My country, Nigeria, the most populous black nation in the world, is endowed with such rich patrimony and cultural diversity in all spheres. Fortunately for us, that culture and the creativity were already <coughs> getting attention despite the lack of government attention and investment. The challenge now is how to harness this abundant cultural heritage and create an economy out of it. More so than we know, there is virtually no state in Nigeria today that cannot boast of three to five cultural industries, be it in pottery, painting, textile making, or leather works, with very strong expression in film, music, theater, etc. We are also motivated by the need to preserve our cultural heritage, which has informed our decision to revive a number of our dormant festivals, like the Arugungu Fishing Festival and the Doba, as well as age-long traditional games like Ayo and traditional wrestling, Ijakadi. As a ministry, I have identified three goals we want to achieve as we pursue our diversification agenda. The first is the provision of key infrastructure that will encourage local and foreign investments into all the key aspects of the culture of the creative industries. The second is the mass creation of jobs and development of skilled and managerial abilities. And the third is formalizing and growing the export of all aspects of the industry so that it becomes a significant foreign exchange earner for the country. The pipes of distribution of all of this creativity will be developed and strengthened with international best practices urgently and wisely domesticated. With approximately 24 million TV households, over 150 television channels, with a greater number of radio, with smartphone penetration edging over 40 million and over 100 million phone lines sold to date, and with over 20 million diaspora Nigerians who are all primary consumers of the creativity located all over the world, and with us being the commercial bedrock of the last frontier, Africa, we are ready for business. Against this background, I sought the support of British Council in assisting the agencies under my ministry to rediscover their capacity and revive the cultural industry as a major source of revenue for the nation. I am happy to report that on Wednesday here, in the great city of Edinburgh, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the British Council that will help revive our moribund festivals and prevent our traditional games, which I referred to earlier, from dying. While other nations are making money and building reputations on their invented games and sports, such as yoga, judo, karate, scrabble, chess, monopoly, etc., our traditional neighborhood games and sports, such as IU, Ari, and EK, have lost appeal among our youths. Together with our partners, including the British Council and the Tony Alumelu Foundation, we hope to reverse this trend. It must be noted that a recent study in the USA revealed that film, TV, and other copyright industries added $1 trillion US dollars to the United States economy in 2012 alone. The California economy, which is one of the leading 10 economies in the world, is centered largely on motion picture, 
television, film, and related entertainment industries domiciled mainly in Hollywood. Drawing from these international developments, I've identified inadequate knowledge and the capacity to translate the nation's abundant cultural heritage into a viable economy as the bane of the sector. I believe the British Council can assist us in the area of capacity building, identification of infrastructure, and more importantly, in the area of organizing how things work in a cooperative manner. Happily, in line with my position, the country directors said the diversification of the economy had equally been a huge challenge in Britain because of the country's over-reliance on industries. She noted that this has been an issue in the UK until very recently, particularly in the North, where many cities have been dependent on industries which have not closed down. She said our country had turned its thinking away from mono-economic dependence by giving vent to its culture and creative industries, which is now contributing positively to the British economy. We have identified some of the key creative industries that are thriving in Nigeria. The Nollywood film industry, which today stands as the second biggest in the world, according to UNESCO, is virtually homegrown. Our music is beginning to find its way into major international markets, and our beats are now featured in chart-topping US hits. We need to benefit from the abundance of our cultural resources like traditional medicine, music, food, cosmetics, performing arts, science and technology, all our expressions, costumes, and body adornment, and so on. We are simply not awake to the fact that our cultural resources offer more lucrative alternatives to our oil deposits in the form of income derivable from entrance fees to facilities and exhibitions, copyright charges for reproduction, and the use of collected rare objects, photographs, and visual images, inquiry charges, sale of publications, publicity materials, and promotion licensing agreements, to mention a few. We need to be alert to harvest our many distinctive, tangible, and intangible cultural resources. Nigeria is open opportunities to boost tourism and the hospitality business through well-organized national and international carnivals and festivals. Each community celebrates its festivals at different times of the year in line with their customs. The government has further created the enabling environment for the celebration of national festivals as well as upgrading them to international festivals. Some of the leading examples are the Abuja Carnival, celebrated in November of every year, the Calabar Festival in December, the Oshun Oshibu Festival in August, and the Arugungu International Fishing Festival in March of every year. We have so much to sell to the world that we create immense information and entertainment value. So many untold stories, so many solutions to various problems. And whilst it's so, we may have seemed unprepared and confused as to what to do, Going forward, we are moving with a plan and clear objectives. There's no doubt that the Nigerian government is determined to reposition creative industry in its quest for economic diversification. However, there are indeed various challenges impeding the process which need to be overcome. We are mapping the whole industry as an intrinsic part of the way forward. And I must once again thank the British Council and their role in helping us overcome this critical foundational hurdle. At this juncture, I wish to thank the organizers of this forum for providing this important platform for a successful interface on culture and its many positive attributes. It has been very exciting to associate with this noble gathering, and today's event really marks a new dimension in our relationship. On this note, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I hereby invite you all to invest massively in the untapped resources of Nigeria's cultural industries as non-oil export alternative for economic growth and development. I thank you for listening.
Thank you very much, Minister, and for that final appeal. And can I thank all our delegates this morning uh, for their thoughtful contributions. Uh, we're now going to uh, break out into discussion groups, so for everyone to participate and engage uh, on the ideas we've heard. Uh, that will take us up to lunch at 12.30. The plenary session this afternoon will start at 2 o'clock. Uh, so now I'm going to hand over to Vicky Little, who's going to tell you exactly what to do. And I close this session.